Hey, 42 here. On the 17th of March 1930, construction started on what would be the tallest building in the world, the Empire State Building. And so, the global battle of which country could erect the biggest structure began. America managed two more erections and held on to its trophy for an impressive 67 years. But then, Kuala Lumpur came swooping in to take the title with a mighty double erection, the Petronas Towers. Taiwan stole it from them in 2004 with Taipei 101. And finally, in 2010, the United Arab Emirates finished construction of the insanely tall Burj Khalifa taking the crown with an impressive 62% height increase. And right now, in a room somewhere, a group of architects hired for their shared love of designing stupidly tall buildings are finishing up the plans for what will be the next monolithic megastructure to take its place amongst the clouds. Scheduled for completion in 2020, Jeddah Tower will be the world's first one kilometre tall man-made structure. This thing will be so mind-bogglingly tall that they may as well have named it Compensation Tower. But all these incredible feats of architecture and engineering have something in common. They are all based on a set of rules. Rules that are so vital that these buildings would never have been possible without them. Neither would many of the other buildings you see around you every single day. These rules are the rules of geometry. These ground rules for the way that shape and space interact with each other were created over 2,300 years ago by a Greek mathematician named Euclid. Euclid wrote a series of 13 books which he named The Elements. They spelt out many of the foundations of number theory and geometry that mathematicians still use today. It is said that Euclid's elements are the most studied books in the world, after the Bible. Another book that is really obsessive about rules, although it seems rules about what one shall or shall not do to thy neighbour's oxen are more popular than that of shapes and numbers. Euclid's principles of geometry have, without a doubt, changed the world. The geometry that Euclid founded is used on thousands of modern-day applications from computer graphics to car and aircraft design and the highly unique shape of Donald Trump's hair. Euclid studied, researched and wrote his 13 books in a very, very special place. A place that held every secret of the ancient world, a true temple of knowledge. It was called the Library of Alexandria. Built under the reign of Alexander the Great in the ancient port of Alexandria in Egypt stood a monolith of knowledge and wisdom. The Library of Alexandria was built on the banks of the Mediterranean Sea in 288 BCE. It was a structure of epic proportions. Historians believe that the library contained reading rooms, meeting rooms, gardens, lecture halls, a shared dining room, an acquisitions department and a cataloguing department. Thankfully, human resources hadn't been created yet. The Library of Alexandria wasn't just a place to come to read scrolls to brush upon your knowledge or maybe even to rent out a blue scroll of Aphrodite's getting it on with Hades. It was also the world's finest research facility. It was in many ways the earliest example of a fully functioning university in all of history. Scholars travelled from all over ancient Greece and beyond to study and carry out research in the Library of Alexandria. Names such as Euclid, one of the greatest mathematicians of all times, graced the halls and rooms of this once great place. As did Eratosthenes, a Greek mathematician who was over 2,000 years ahead of his time. In 1957, Sputnik was launched the first man-made satellite to be launched into space. We have since sent out many more satellites to forever orbit our planet. Today, there are around 1,100 lumps of metal orbiting our planet, collectively costing many billions of pounds to launch and to maintain. One of the major reasons we began launching satellites into space was to answer a very simple question. What is the circumference of the Earth? How big is this huge lump of rock that we live upon? 
until we had an incredibly accurate measurement of Earth. Technologies such as GPS were impossible. But over 2,000 years ago, an ancient Greek mathematician who studied and worked at the Library of Alexandria simply stuck a stick into the ground at Alexandria and worked out the circumference of the Earth. Eratosthenes was his name and he didn't need a billion dollar satellite, just fairly basic maths. Using the distance between Alexandria and the nearby town of Siem, and the shadow that was cast by the stick he placed in the ground, he used mathematics to conclude that the Earth's circumference is 40,000 kilometers. And guess what we found out after spending billions of pounds on space technology 2,000 years later? We discovered that the Earth's circumference is about 40,075 kilometers. That's right, Eratosthenes was out by just 75 kilometers. That's almost negligible. Well done, man with stick. Very impressive. This is just the tip of the many multitude of incredible discoveries, studies and experiments conducted at the Library of Alexandria. But sadly, we cannot see beyond the tip of this iceberg of knowledge and discovery. For it is all lost. You see, the Library of Alexandria was burned down. If you ask any historian which historical moments they mourn the most, the day the Library of Alexandria was destroyed will likely be at the very top of their list, right alongside the moment that George Lucas decided to make the Star Wars prequels. It is thought that if the Library of Alexandria had never burnt down, the progress of humankind would be one thousand years ahead of what it is now. The Library of Alexandria contained a lot of scrolls. It is estimated that there were around 700,000 scrolls stored within the walls of this once great place. These scrolls would have held almost all of the secrets of the ancient world and filled numerous gaps of historical knowledge that we have today. They covered every topic from maths to medicine, science to history. The incredible things that we could have learned from this library boggles the mind. But the way the library gathered such an incredible collection of knowledge is somewhat barbaric. The very purpose of the Library of Alexandria's existence, the reason it was built in the first place, was to collect and catalogue all of the world's knowledge in one place. You see, the city of Alexandria was a trading port and every day hundreds of ships would dock into the harbour to conduct trade. It was mandatory that every single ship that docked in Alexandria would be searched from bow to stern by the authorities upon its arrival. But they weren't looking for gold and treasures. Oh no, they were looking for scrolls and any other bits of knowledge they could find. Any scrolls would be seized and taken to the library where they would be hand copied word for word and then the original would be stored in the library of Alexandria and only the copy would be returned back to the owner of the ship. That's like when a company asks for a photocopy of your passport but instead they just take your actual passport and give you back the photocopy. See how far that's going to get you. <laughs> On a royal mandate, library officials were also tasked with travelling all over the markets and the book fairs from Rhodes to Athens and hoovering up any scrolls or documents they could obtain. The result of all this was one of the greatest collections of knowledge the world has ever seen. There is no doubt that the library contained masses of knowledge and history of the ancient world that we could only dream of knowing today. It was the ancient version of the Vatican secret archives, but many times grander in scale and content. Also quite a bit less secret. But then one day a man in a toga came along and accidentally burnt this great library to the ground. How do you accidentally burn down a humongous library, you may be thinking? And that is a very, very good question. That silly man in a toga was Julius Caesar. Caesar was an obsessive conqueror. On an average day, he conquered at least two cities before his morning muesli. So the seat of knowledge within the Greek empire that was the port of Alexandria was a lovely looking cherry atop of his world map. And it was juicy enough for Caesar to attempt an invasion. 
But in 48 BCE, when he rocked up at Alexandria's harbour with his small fleet of Roman ships, he noticed that the Egyptian fleet docked at Alexandria were quite a bit greater in number than what he had brought with him. So in true Julius Caesar style, he had his troops set a light to them all and burned all the Egyptian ships to smithereens. He only intended to burn the ships, but the fire got so out of control that it quickly spread to the royal quarter of Alexandria, where the library was situated. The fire soon engulfed a large section of the Great Library, forever destroying many thousands of scrolls. It's estimated that after the fire, the collection went down from 700,000 scrolls to around 200,000. Julius Caesar was a great admirer of books and literature. Historians insist that he would have been rather remorseful that the fire had inadvertently destroyed part of the greatest library of all time. But Caesar can't take all of the infamy for this great institute's eventual demise. After the fire, there were a number of attempts to keep the library going. It was extended and moved. But due to a succession of wars and invaders, it was eventually destroyed, piece by piece. And sadly, so was almost every piece of literature within its walls. Throughout its time, the library was actually set fire to three times. It was getting to the point where they should have started taking bets on when it was going to next burst into flames. Due to mixed reports of the events, historians aren't exactly sure who actually finished off the library after Caesar's accidental fire, but three names continuously pop up throughout the textbooks as potential suspects. The first suspect is Roman soldier Tanagio Probus, under the orders of Roman Emperor Aurelian in 270 CE. The second suspect is Theopolis, the Pope of Alexandria, in 391 CE, as part of a Christian crusade to destroy all scientific literature. Because you know, science has caused so many wars and endless suffering worldwide. Religion has never done anything like that. And finally, in 640 CE, the once great and now dying library was reportedly finished off by Caliph Umar when his Muslim army captured Alexandria and the rest of Egypt. It is written that when he captured the city, he said, If these books are in agreement with the Quran, then we have no need of them. And if they are opposed to the Quran, destroy them. It has been said that the destruction of the Library of Alexandria set human progress back by 1,000 years. If it had survived, we could today be living in a world of self-driving flying cars, frequent space travel, superhuman AI, and a knife that toasts bread as you slice it. There has been much debate over this claim, and it may be quite exaggerated, but whether the loss of what was once the greatest library in the world really did hinder human progress or not, the fact remains that it was one of the greatest tragedies of all of history. And there are many historians who would kill to read just 5% of the scrolls that it contained. Well, historians aren't really known for their killings. Perhaps I should rephrase that to, there are many who would pay a very reasonable amount of monies. But as with all tragedies, there is a lesson to be learnt here. Knowledge is humanity's single greatest achievement. Scientific achievements have saved millions of lives and every day knowledge is built upon all around the world and is used to keep us all safe, provide transport, food and water to those who need it the most. So, as a society, may we never let another book burn, unless it's Fifty Shades of Grey. Thanks for watching. As you may or may not know, YouTube has recently enabled viewers of channels like mine to join the channel as a private member, which massively helps support this channel's growth and secure its future in a world of highly unstable ad revenue. My videos will always be free for you guys because without you all, I wouldn't be able to do these videos to this day and do what I do. Not a day goes by where I'm not so thankful for each and every person who regularly tunes in to watch me talk about complete rubbish. 
my videos will still be free for everyone. But by joining this channel, by clicking the join button below the video, you will be helping to keep this channel alive and kicking for years to come. Also, you will get to join an exclusive Members Only 42 Club here on YouTube, where you can discuss anything you like with myself and other members. I will occasionally be posting short, private videos of my day-to-day -day life and random thoughts to the Members Only. Plus, you will get to watch all of my future videos at least a day before everyone else. And you will get a custom emoji and badge to use when you comment on this channel. If you like the sound of all of that and would like to help support the channel, then just tap the button that says join below the video. And if not, then you're still an incredible person simply for stopping by. So thanks so much.